William, trick or treat. <laughs> oh, Judy, there are no tricks, mm -hmm. only treats on this new episode of Garden Time. Welcome to Garden Time. We are at Garden Gallery Ironworks where a big event is happening today. And that big event is that the artist Dean Krauser is actually going to be here from 11 to 2 and today only all of his products and merchandise will be 20% off. And also coming up in the show today we'll show you how to get your garden ready for winter. But coming up first we go hunting for mushrooms. So it is a real delight to me to be out here in one of the many beautiful forests of the Pacific Northwest and I'm with Leah. So Leah, tell me who you are with and why we're out here. <laughs> so hi, my name is Leah Benlin and uh, I'm here with the Oregon Mycological Society and we are out here doing a field trip looking for all of the different mushrooms that we can find, hopefully finding some really good edibles, learning about habitat, and then also just learning about all of the cool species that we're finding. So, you know, we've been out here a while and doing some filming and watching people, you know, search for mushrooms. And my mind kept telling me, ah, oh, there's so many dangerous ones, but there really are some that are delicious that you can get right out here in the wild. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's, there's a lot of mycophobia out there. <laughs> And, and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of fear of mushrooms, but it's okay. You can touch all of the mushrooms that are out there. You're not going to get poisoned just by touching them. Right. And there's a lot of delicious edibles out there that you can also find. And we have a couple of them right here. And they're freakishly beautiful, first of all. That's yeah. what I noticed straight away. But tell me about these two and, and what you do with them. Okay, so this one right here is the cauliflower mushroom. Wow. Somebody found this straight out of the car, which is a pretty lucky find. Um, and this is a delicious edible mushroom. Looks like wavy egg noodles. One of the great things about this mushroom is that it has no poisonous lookalikes. It oh, is nice. really easy to ID and it is delicious. So even a simple person like me could figure that one out if I find yeah. that, that If you okay. find something that looks like this, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, um, and then could you hold this? Sure I will. Okay, so then we also have the lobster mushroom right here bright orange mushroom that Beautiful. is a tasty edible. Um, it grows actually on another mushroom that is pretty bland called Russula brevipes, which is just a white, plain, big looking mushroom and completely deforms it. This is where the gills would be on that Russula and it has completely like fused them shut and it turns it a rather bland mushroom into a rather tasty wow. mushroom. And so there, there are things that we have to be aware of, but one of the great things about the Mycological Society is you can actually be a novice and learn yeah, about sure. stuff from y'all. Yeah, yeah, we do classes. We do a beginner and intermediate ID class. Um, we do a fall mushroom show. Which and... is happening soon, isn't it? I've got this right here. <laughs> yes, it's happening tomorrow on Sunday. Um, so here's our flyer for the fall mushroom show. We're going to have speakers that will get, I'll be giving a presentation on uh, common fall mushrooms and their lookalikes. We'll have a presentation on um, how to get started mushrooming, some poison information, some cooking information. We'll have book sales and the main feature is probably thousands of different mushrooms that will be on display nice. and identified so that you can see some of the beautiful variety that's out there. So now we, we were out here but this is a very specific thing and you knew where to come out to look for this kind of stuff but if you're on your own what what is it that you're looking for to find mushrooms? Sure, so uh, people are very secretive about their spots because it can take many years to find a good spot. Right. Um, and we're lucky enough that Paul shared his spot with us today. But you are looking for certain kinds of trees. Um, our state mushroom, which is the Pacific Golden Chanterelle, associates generally with dug fir trees. And we have an awful lot of dug right, fir trees right. in Oregon. Um, however, you also need it to be at certain elevations and certain temperatures. So the season starts high and then goes low as the, uh, as the season goes on and you get cooler temperatures in lower lands. Um, so it, the, the spots where you find them actually vary, really vary. over time. And then there, there, 
you should be aware of maybe checking around before you just go out randomly searching. For sure. So different places require different permitting systems. So wherever you're thinking about going, you need to check with the, the agency that covers that. Like if you're going on private land, you need to ask someone first. If you are going out to national forests, there are generally free uh, personal use permits. Um, and then some state forests, you can go out and you actually don't need a permit as, at all as long as you are collecting only for personal use Excellent. and only in limited amounts. Well, you know, we cover so many flowers and trees and shrubs, but this is another wonderful, beautiful, and often edible part of nature. So if you'd like more information on this great event happening tomorrow, we always invite you to go to gardentime.tv. We'll click you over to their website. Go out and enjoy something maybe new in your life. Thank you so much, Leah. Yeah, thank you. And get out there and enjoy some mushrooms. Right. Garden Time is brought to you by Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people. Is your garden in need of refreshment? Hi, I'm Sarah, and there are plenty of things in bloom at Portland Nursery. Come check out our beautiful fall color to perk up your garden. At Portland Nursery, we consider fall the second season, and the gardening opportunities are endless. Establish next year's trees, replace lettuce and greens, or get a jump on onions and garlic. Portland Nursery, a passion for plants, a nursery for plant people, on 50th and Stark and 90th and Division, or at portlandnursery.com. Take the hard work out of yard work with the amazing new leaf hopper. It's so lightweight and easy to use and it goes where wheelbarrows can't. Simply fill, then fold, then funnel into yard containers or compost bags. It's perfect for carrying leaves, twigs, branches, and more. Use the leaf hopper to add mulch or gravel in no time. Get your leaf hopper today for only $19.99 plus shipping and handling online at easyhaultarp.com. All major credit cards accepted, that's easyhaultarp.com. Don't let the cold and wet get you this winter. Warm up to a season of heat with Grimm's Fuel. Grimm's has plenty of wood and heating oil ready to deliver to keep you warm all winter long. Stay warm and cozy with Grimm's Fuel. Build a beautiful home inside and out at French Prairie Perennials. Inside, we have just the right creative elements to complete your decor. We offer an oasis of unusual nature-inspired garden and home gifts and accessories. Outside, choose from our wide selection of unique dwarf conifers and sparkling companion plants. French Prairie Perennials, located between Woodburn and Wilsonville. Take exit 278 to Aurora and French Prairie Perennials. I am in Camas, Washington today with Cassie Marshall. And Cassie, what organization are you with? So this is the Camas Ivy League. We are an all-volunteer group um, that is funded by our local nonprofit, partners with Camas Parks and Recreation. Um, and we also are kind of overseen by our local City of Camas Parks Commission. Uh, and then where are we exactly? So we are at um, a city park. So this is the City of Camas Park. And there's a skate park here. But then we have some beautiful wooded area that leads down to the Washougal River. So huh. it's an especially gorgeous park. Yeah, it is. And your group today is making it even better because you're pulling ivy off of these trees. And look at this stem that one of the ones they took off. This is just amazing. It's a tree trunk practically. It really is. And sometimes they are even larger. We have taken off literally trunks before. So. And so what is everybody doing here and what are they just pulling it off? They are. So we try, um, our focus is to strive to get the ivy out of the trees. That's our primary focus. So once the ivy gets up into the tops of the trees, it actually spreads so much more. So it fruits and berries and the birds spread it. And so even though there's ivy on the ground, what our group tries to do is really get it out of the trees. And so that's just kind of a stopgap prevention to help uh, keep the ivy from spreading. And really people don't understand that it's really detrimental to the trees because these trees are actually oak trees and there's no branches until the very top. Right, so the ivy grows up the trees um, just prolifically and it does, it, it um, kind of chokes the branches off of the trees. And then the other hazards are that when the ivy um, gets really big and heavy at the tops of the trees, it will actually bring the trees down. Wow. So to get it out and get that weight off um, is just essential. And really it changes its physiology of the plant. Like when they're growing on the ground, it's one kind of plant, but when it starts growing up, it changes. 
is. Correct. So when it gets to a certain height and it gets the right balance of light and um, and I'm not really sure what the physiological right, it's changes very are, but I'm not a plant biologist. <laughs> but um, it do definitely does, and so that's when it starts to fruit and berry. So, um, so getting it off the trees, that's why that is such a crucial first step. So. And your group really has many events over the season. So where all this brown kind of ivy is, that's from earlier in the summer. Exactly. So we hit this in June, and over the summer, um, you can see some of what has died off. Um, but then we could also see what we really missed. So <laughs> there's a lot more work to do. And this is just one of many parks. We have hit parks and green spaces throughout Camas for the past three years. Oh, so wow. Making a difference. Yeah. So Casey, I see that where you guys worked in June. So that's dead, but you're back again. So it's an ongoing thing. You're back. Unfortunately, it's very ongoing. So you can also see on some of these trees um, that we tackled in June, it's already coming back up from the ground and will mm, be a couple sure. feet back up the tree. Um, so it kind of requires constant vigilance. Um, um, the city of Camas has committed to working on some of the ground removal with us also and that will be the perfect long-term solution so like I said before what we do right now is focus on getting it out of the trees and then coming back and trying to keep it out of the trees so right. yeah and then what about as homeowners what can we do to help well, I think the, the primary thing you could do as homeowners would be to not plant it in your yard because um, it is beautiful. It's a beautiful plant and I understand the appeal, but once it um, fruits, the birds spread it to areas like mm -hmm. this and then wow. this is what happens. Nobody planted this ivy here. It came and it thrived um, and it is choking out our green spaces throughout the whole Pacific Northwest. So not planting it, if you do have it, maybe even consider removing it from your yard, especially if it's fruiting, um, which it often will along fences or on high walls. It will often fruit. And if you notice that, that would just be a wonderful time to take it out. Right, right. So really there's some tips there for the homeowners and also there's events going on up here in Camas and other cities and we'll have all those links that if you wanna be a volunteer to help get rid of the ivy that's really harming our woodlands, um, please go to Garden Time website and we'll click over there to those websites. Sites. Well, thank you for all that oh. you do and all your groups. It's just thank wonderful you. to meet it's you. It's really the awesome volunteers. They they put in the, the time and the effort and it's good stuff. Yeah, thank definitely. you. Thank you. Uh -huh. So I am standing with Don Sprague at Garden Gallery Ironworks and there is a wonderful, I think a delightful event happening today. Tell me about it. We're having the Dean Krauser event down here. Dean is a local artist from Oregon and uh, we have featured all of his products that we can find that he makes and there's just a great selection of uh, coffee cups, uh, spoon holders, little dishes, uh, and trivets. I have to say that it is true because the amount of different types of products that you have here available from this artist really are inspiring. I mean there's so many different types of things to purchase from him. Yeah, there's something for everybody. You know, even Christmas ornaments we've got with right. Dean Krauser on them. And so one of the things that's fun is today you can actually meet Dean from 11 to 2. Right? Correct. He's going to be here for uh, kind of an open house for Dean Krauser. And he'll be here to sign the products that you buy. He can put, put his name on them. Or if you've got something uh, that you want signed to his, we'll just bring it on in. And we'll be happy to do it. Right, and also, I think that you have a great gift that you're giving to the first 50 people that are coming in. Yes, the first 50 people will get a free little refrigerator magnet with a Dean Krauser painting on it, and it's a really nice little gift, so you want to be here early. Well, you know, one of the things I really admire about you and this company is that you guys really do support artists. That they're often local, and you really, you just commit to them and make so much available to the consumer who wants to buy them. We do. And, you know, Dean Krauser has a history in Oregon. He's, right. uh, he's, uh, he's an Oregon athlete, and uh, he's just done a lot for Oregon, and his paintings are just adding to that. Well, you know, it's always a blast when they have events out here, but uh, besides just this event, we are going to take a walk to somewhere else and talk about something else that's going on, shall we? You bet. Lots going on. Okay, Don. Now, obviously, we are in a place that is set up for Christmas here now. Tell me about what's going on with that. We got our big holiday open house coming up November 16th, nice. and we're going to open an hour early. So nine o'clock we'll open that day, and we'll have great discounts. And you know we'll have that famous Christmas cocktail, and uh, some finger foods. So uh, we've got a lot of Christmas uh, in the store. There's like about a dozen Christmas trees all decorated, 
So we are ready. And honestly, even people, uh, when people come out to see Dean's artwork here, you've already got all this set up so they can do some shopping for Christmas and other holiday decorations even oh, now. Yes. <laughs> it's a great time to pick up that early Christmas gift because you know, some of this stuff won't be here. Well, that is true because it sells. It sells Yeah, fast. wonderful. Well, you know, every time we come out here, we have such a blast and we enjoy the, the process of interacting with Don and the customers that come out here. So if you're saying, I love art, and I love the holidays. Come on out today, visit with Dean, and then do some shopping for your own Christmas uh, fun times. Thank you so much. You betcha. Merry Christmas. You as well. <laughs>Well, you know, it's that change of season and everyone has chores. Next door is getting their carpet cleaned. And then we are going to be taking care of our irrigation system. And I'm with Kevin McCallum. And Kevin, where do you work? I work for the uh, City of Lake Oswego. I'm a water conservation specialist. But we also are a member of the Regional Water Providers Consortium, so we partner with them in helping people manage their water better. Uh, and we're always talking with them about different things, but today we're going to be talking about winterizing our irrigation system. And the first thing on my checklist is the backflow. So what is a backflow? A backflow is an assembly that's placed in the ground and it's a health safety issue. It's, it's designed to prevent anything from your irrigation water getting back into the potable system. They use it to protect the potable system. If people were to use fertilizer or anything oh, sure. like that, it, it prevents it from getting back. It's also primarily the biggest expense if it goes south on you in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. So it's something that you really need to pay attention to. So at this time of year, do we have to turn it off? When you're done sprinkling for the year, the first thing that you want to do is physically turn your sprinkler system off. Most of them will have a valve to the rear of the backflow preventer. Okay, just turn it all and the way just off. Just turn it off. All right. What that does is that prevents if anything happens through the course of the year, if there's an accident or somebody digs with a shovel or something, you, you won't have water going out, losing water. All right. The next thing we want to look at is this backflow preventer. And if you look on these three, four like um, test ports, mm -hmm. see these? This is where the backflow preventer um, tester comes in and certifies that your backflow preventer is working properly. That needs to be done every year. I usually recommend either at the end of the season or at the first of the season, but you want that tested and certified. You can go online to most of the water providers and they'll have a list of certified technicians. If you're not in an area that has that list, um, a simple web search for certified backflow technicians will get you numbers of people that can do that for you. Oh, perfect. And then I have some bubble wrap here, so are we gonna use that? Right, so the, the, we, we're not prone to really deep freezes in the Portland region. 
it can happen occasionally, but it's not, not real likely. So the number one thing that we want to prevent from freezing is this guy because that's the highest dollar sure? to fix. Okay. So I just use bubble wrap. I like it because it's, it's insulation and it also resists moisture so it doesn't hold it. Okay. And typically you just tuck this stuff in and around your backflow preventer and leave it loose. You don't need to tape it up or anything. You just want to get around that backflow preventer. So a couple layers there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then just cover it back up and, and then we're put good your till valve spring. box cover right back on over the top. And what that does is that the, the, the heat from the ground is constantly rising and that acts as, a, as sort of a blanket that holds that heat in. We're good to go. All right. Well, we have some other things we're going to talk about, but they're closer to the house. So let's go over there. Okay. So, Kevin, we're up near the garage, so what do we have to do here? Well, you want to protect all your exposed piping. Mm -hmm. So any of your hose bibs, um, any of your hoses you want to protect. So the, the easiest thing to do is just when you're, when you're done for the, for the year, mm -hmm. is just lay your hose out and drain it out. And you can see the water coming out there. Oh, sure. And drain that all out and then stick it in your garage or someplace. And then we have to protect the spigot too? The spigot as well. And so these are these are handy. You can find them in great. any big box store. They just cover over. You'll see inside is a little loop. Right. This little loop will go around the valve. Okay. It is flexible, supposedly. There we go. And that just hooks on there. This comes out here and then you have a, a tie. And just tighten it down. Just tighten it down. Wow, that's great. And that'll protect them for... And what about like the shutoff system, like where the automatic, all the controls, what do we do with that? Uh, you should, now that you got your back flush shut, you should just go ahead and turn off your controller now. That, the thing I want to emphasize though, is many people when they turn their systems off, they just turn the controller off. Really important to turn it okay. off down there too. All right, and what about gutters? I know that my gutters are full and they're kind of overflowing. The, the purpose of a gutter is to direct that water into the storm drains. If you get um, blockages and debris in there, mm -hmm. they overflow and they come down on your garden or the walls of your house and they make a big mess. So cleaning your gutter out, very good thing to do in the winter time. All right. And then what if we see like pools of water and it really hasn't rained a lot yet? Yeah, you, the first thing you want to do is check your meter. Mm. And by doing that, you, you just make sure nobody's using any water, everything's off and go down and look at that meter and you can make a mark on it come back in a half hour and look and see if that needle has moved. If that needle hasn't moved, you don't have a leak and that's probably subsurface drainage. Right, right. Well, he's given us so many great tips here and you know, there's always chores to go on this time of year. So really, if you need more information, please go to Garden Time. We can click you over to the regional h2o.org website and they have much more tips for you and to keep everything really safe and working well for you in your garden. Thanks so much, Kevin. Thank you. At Blooming Junction, fall isn't about winding down, it's about getting ready. In the garden, start the next season off right, right now. Fall plantings produce healthier, more robust, and drought tolerant plants than those planted in spring or summer. In the kitchen, get ready for the holidays with fresh, organically grown produce from our fields. So whether it's for the garden or for the kitchen this season, Blooming Junction is your place for quality, uncommon plants and produce for your home and garden. Don't let the cold and wet get you this winter. Warm up to a season of heat with Grimm's Fuel. Grimm's has plenty of wood and heating oil ready to deliver to keep you warm all winter long. Stay warm and cozy with Grimm's Fuel. In 1947, Clement Gander started Standard TV and Appliance in Southeast Portland. Standard is celebrating its 72nd anniversary with price cuts in every category, including top brand dishwashers, side-by-side -side and French door refrigerators, and Simmons Beautyrest mattresses. Plus, right now at Standard TV and Appliance, save up to 40% on display and pro-style products. Setting the standard since 1947, Standard TV and Appliance.
this time of year, we're seeing a lot of squash at farmer's markets, at produce stands. And I'm at Bauman's Farm and Gardens with Brian Bauman. And Brian, you know, for us um, grocery shoppers, we're seeing a lot of um, different kind of squashes. But what if we're, we're planting them at home? When do we pick them? So I use really two cues to tell me when a squash is ready. The color of the squash and also the vines, how okay. they look. So when you're talking about color, um, with a lot of your squash, this is where it was touching the ground. Okay. And so once it gets that nice golden, almost orange color on its bottom, that's a good indication that it's ready to go. Okay. And I also look, because um, sometimes with some other types of squash, like you mentioned, there's lots of varieties, you also want to wait till all the, the vines have died back, which is another good indication that it's ripe and ready to go. All right. And now this is an acorn squash, and it's love eating. I love eating them. You put mm -hmm. them in the oven and a little brown sugar, and you're done mm -hmm. with it. But what about all these other ones? They're just gorgeous. And a lot of people, this the only squash they've ever tried and there's actually <laughs> other varieties that are wonderful this is by far my son's favorite and my mom's favorite this is called delicata and again you can see it has a nice golden color to it so mm -hmm. that's a good indication that it's ripe and all you have to do to cook this is put it in the microwave for three minutes then poke some holes in it put it back in the microwave for another three minutes then cut it in half scoop out the seeds and then like you said add your butter brown sugar another three minutes and within 10 minutes dinner's done Wow, and to get a kid to eat squash, wow, that's My kids excellent. love it, but that's only the beginning, too. There's lots of other varieties. Um, this is what we call pie pumpkin. Okay. Um, it's pie called that because of the size of the pumpkin. It's about the right size for a pie, and it has less water than some of the other pumpkins. Oh, okay. But actually, if you're going to make pumpkin pie, sweet meat squash is the best actually for making pumpkin pie. And it's like a blue pumpkin or blue squash. It looks like it, yeah, but it has not nearly as much water content, so your pumpkin pies turn out a lot better. Nice. And then, of course, butternut, which makes lovely soup. Wonderful for that. Um, we also have another one called um, Baby Blue, mm -hmm. which is a small Hubbard squash. And you can tell because the large <laughs> Hubbard squash is so big, sometimes it's hard to get that much in. Oh my gosh, sitting. it would feed like 25 people. Yes. <laughs> Brian, there's a few more that we need to talk about. So what else do you have here? This is actually called a gold nugget, which is by far the best keeping squash. This will hold for months in your garage or in just a cool place in your house. Ah, nice. And also, this is actually on the other end of the spectrum. This is called a buttercup. And this one actually doesn't keep very well. Probably about two to three weeks in your garage or a cool place. Mm -hmm. um, but it has, it is the most dense squash per the size of it. Mm -hmm. And it is very, very sweet. One of our best sellers. Ah, great. Now what about these little guys? I use these just for decoration, but can we eat them too? They're actually edible, ah. believe it or not. And a lot of people don't know that, but they work great for decoration. They hold up really well. Um, but it's kind of something fun for the kids to eat too sometimes, <laughs> just to give them a try. Oh, great. We have lots of different varieties at Bowman Farms, um, so you can always come out. We have a great staff that knows a lot about the, all the different types of squash, and um, there's so much to choose from. It's a lot of fun. Well, you know, there's always fun to come out here. You know, Thank there's you. just not the squash and everything else, all the different other kind of things. But really, to get out in the garden and finish off all those squashes and bring them in and maybe make some recipes. It just feels like fall. It does. Yeah. It does. Well, thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you. We want to thank you for watching today and don't forget about the Dean Krauser event happening at the Garden Gallery Ironworks right here in Hubbard. And while you're marking your calendars, put November 16th down because that is the Garden Gallery Ironworks Christmas Open House. And for all this information, please go to Gardentime.tv. We sure appreciate you watching the show today and if you've enjoyed it, let's do it again next week right here on Garden Time. The proceeding was a paid program of the Gustin Creative Group and its sponsors.